You're listening to Top Line Edmonton with Nick Lynham and JC Kennedy. Welcome back to the Top Line Edmonton Oilers podcast, where the Oilers took two steps forward and two steps back and are about where we were a week ago. To talk about it, let's bring in JC Kennedy, who's had the pain of following this being his favorite team. And before I ask you how you're doing, I got to ask you, don't you think this team would be better off winning 4-1 hockey games <laughs> than 6-4 or whatever the quote was? 4-1 <laughs> or 7-5. That's, that's, I mean. that's how we're going to jump right into this. I had to. I had to go there. <laughs> Oh man, what a what a question to ask! <laughs> and the but, ensuing drama with Tim Peel. The, this has been the, the most fun I've seen <laughs> on social media. Like we'll host the fight. I'll put on a top line promotion watching oh, in a heartbeat. <laughs> disgraced ref Tim Peel versus uh, Homer oh, journalist God. Mark Spector. Um, how are you doing? Other than that, though. <laughs> oh man, it's. Uh... I've been I've been all right. It's this year has been something that's two two steps forward and two steps back was the perfect way to describe this week or pretty much this year. It's uh it's been a whirlwind, that's for sure. And this this week was awfully funny because the one thing we were talking about last week as far as optimism goes with the Edmonton Oilers, they go one and two this week. They win the game. They didn't really control the flow of play. And then they lost the two that... I think the floor game was probably a coin flip, but they definitely all played Tampa in that one. So it was like, oh, absolutely, what's yeah. going on here? Um, let's jump right into the Seattle game. <laughs> a 4-3 win against a team they have to beat right now, especially yeah. in that division. Uh, Over time, though, so Seattle still gets a point. A team... I think right now they're second wild card right now. So that's kind of the spot Crocking, Edmonton yeah. would be chasing. Yeah. But a 4-3 win nonetheless. A game that featured a lot of high danger chances for both teams. Bit of a track meet there. Uh, what were your takeaways from that game? I mean, yeah. Just uh, much like every single game it has been this year. You you get down in the game and you're, you're chasing, chasing the game and... You know, luckily this one just worked out in their favor. Obviously, they haven't been at all this year. Like you said, it was a a bit of a track meet. Not a lot of defensive play on both teams. Um, you, this is the Evander Kane game, that's for sure. Though. Two two in the two in the third and the OT winner. So that was really the only bright spot in that game. Um, there really wasn't much to like at all. They the Oilers didn't play well. Just. You call, you call wind a little bit in the third period and luckily got yourself in into a game against the team that's you had just as equal struggles. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where the effort sucked, but it's also you need points at all costs right now yeah. for the Edmonton Oilers. Uh -huh. So you take the two, and honestly, I'm glad you went to the Evander Kane thing because that was a guy very early in this year had a really tough start. Got into it with the coach, and I know me and you, especially me, based on his history with the Winnipeg Jets, we're kind of worried about the year going off the rails with Evander Kane early on. He's really responded to that early season benching in, in a big way. He's been one of two bright spots up front. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like I was a little more optimistic, like like we talked about in the after the uh, benching and everything. Just looking at his interview, his his just body language and the way he said like the words he said in the interview was a little more better than what he probably would have said in the past or acted in the past. But yeah, after, after that situation, he really hasn't looked back and he's, he's arguably, he's been the, probably a top three forward on this team so far this season after that situation, which is good. And also says something about the Edmonton Oilers because we yeah. both have Zach Hyman in there, which means if Evander Kane's been a top three, that means one of the big two one that they the big need two isn't, yeah. hasn't been, right? Yep. On, on Evander Kane, he's got seven points in his last five games. Big yep. stretch. Um, a couple multi-point games uh, right before that stretch as well. He's been red hot. But uh, let's move in. Let's move into the Tampa Bay game, which had it kind of felt like a dagger type of moment. Would it, would, I know you didn't catch the third. 
Uh, what did you see out of that game in the first 40? Yeah, the first 40, no doubter that was easily the best game of their season. They looked like a totally different team from what, from what we've seen at the start of this season, just absolutely dominating Tampa Bay on and playing really well defensively, really. like They just took the game by the hands and didn't look back. Luck, well, I guess I wouldn't say luckily, but I did have to miss the third period. Hitting the road for my hockey game, which I obviously missed a lot in all for, for all the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. But um, this one was probably one of the most frustrating games for me just for to see how well they did play and just kind of flip the switch in the wrong direction in the last 20 there. Um, you you get a game where it's a lot of depth scoring and secondary scoring provided in the from the Edmonton Oilers and Tampa's best players and specialty teams are what what got them the victory essentially and you don't hear that too too often when it's coming from the Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, it, it was a game where I think if you take out the big negative highlight and we've all or was that that was the Florida game, right? Or that, sorry, that was the other game. Yeah. But if you take away some of the big turnovers and big moments. I thought Edmonton really had the, the more dangerous chances all night. They had the the flow of play. I thought they controlled it up until that bang, bang to go down. Yeah. And then it felt like, and I think this is a positive, but there's only so many moral victories with the Oilers. I thought they put the pedal down and they were all over Tampa the rest of that period until the empty netter. Expected goals in that game were four and a half to 2.7. Yeah. Like... The, that was a good effort, but still not good enough. And there's no more. At the end of November here, we're running out of runaway. You're to, really running out of leeway. Before we do shit on the Oilers a little more here, I yep. do want to shout out James Hamblin, his first career goal, National Hockey League goal. Obviously a, a really feel-good moment for him. Obviously his mom passing away with cancer. So yes. that goal, he's always been someone we talked about even last year, getting the call up to the to the Oilers, just a, a very hardworking player. So it was really cool to see him get rewarded there. Yeah, those are, those are a story like that are the stories you watch sports for, I think, at times, 100%. right? Like, obviously, we get into the, this game. We love the sport. We talk about it every week through the highs and the lows. But there's also that human element that sometimes I think we all forget about. Yeah. And to see a guy like that score is, like, even for me, pretty emotional. Obviously, that's a big moment. The point to the sky, yeah. dedicating it to his mom that passed away. Uh, shout out James Hamlin. That is, yeah, great, great touch. I, I had wanted to go there. I'm glad you did. And it, it I, don't, I don't know, man. The rest of this, I, I don't know what to do with it. Um, <laughs> you know what's tough about this game? Is it's a game where you didn't see any of the big guys on the score sheet? No, and that's the th- like those are games they need to pretty much step like you got beat by the other team's best players. That is something you don't see a lot, obviously coming from the Edmonton Oilers. But yeah, it was it was flat out the Tampa Bay's star players and the power play uh, outclassing Edmonton's. Yeah, and I mean. Six goals again, or sorry, five in 24 shots. Uh, I had made a, a bit of a joke tweet about it that uh, Bakersfield, if this rate keeps going on, might have the, a more expensive goalie tandem than the Arizona Coyotes. <laughs> they Man. need Stuart Skinner to find it. They do, and it was starting to look that way when he had a very good game against the, the Kraken with the 4-1 victory, and then he had a very solid game against the Islanders. Obviously, he let in that goal early, but nothing after that. So you... You're getting optimistic, thinking he'd come around, but uh, obviously not the case. <laughs> and yeah, just it, it, it's such a kick in the nuts right now for the Edmonton Oilers to not get offense from the big guns. To Connor McDavid's credit, I thought this was probably the best all around week we've seen in some time. The from Florida McDa- trip? Uh, yeah, the Florida trip from yeah. Connor McDavid. I think we saw a guy that looks back, even in this game. He generated the second most goals, expected goals in that game, so clearly he's all over it. One of the worst players on the Oilers in that regard was Leon Dreisaitl, which is, I, I, I'm starting to get concerned about him, and I don't want to go overboard with it, but obviously he's not scoring right now and uh, looks awfully frustrated, Yeah, which takes us into the Florida game because I do want to touch on something when it comes to Dreisaitl and a few guys, but 
We saw the Edmonton Oilers go to the journeyman Manitoban, Calvin Picard, <laughs> um, for the Florida game. <laughs> and another Edmonton loss, 5-3. to three. What's your takeaways here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I figured this would be would have been the, the biggest test. Mm. Obviously, Florida's been off to a great start yeah. with, without their top two D-man. And then they obviously have them back in this game, so you think they... They're gonna they take steps from there. Continue to continue to roll, but uh, no, like again, a, a very good start from Edmonton. Like, you know, they get up by by a pair. Something we haven't been seeing a lot this year. They've been chasing the games, so it was a nice change. And then obviously, e, e Vander Gain gets a really nice goal and kind of takes a a foolish penalty on Matthew Kachuk, where the Florida Panthers capitalize, and then. Yeah, it's it's a whirlwind again. Just making s- stupid errors in the defensive zone, very costly errors. Um, I thought Kelvin Picard was f- fine, serviceable, really, like mm-hmm. what you would have expected. He's a obviously an AHL caliber goalie. Made a lot of nice saves in the game, but also let in a few softies. Again, he's a, he's an AHL caliber goalie. I I didn't expect much. This was a game you wanted to see the Oilers, obviously focus even more on the defensive zone knowing this is your situation it's been the situation all year i guess so i don't know what i was expecting because yeah. it's just frustrating like there's no words for it there really isn't like the and I, and I can't put it on him we saw some massive defensive breakdowns for the enemy no 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 absolutely not and it's been this kind of the same thing with Stuart skin you can't put everything on him because these these errors are insanely foolish to say the least. And it's, it, I think what's tough about the Florida trip is it's two games where they had a 3 2 lead and yep. blew a lead in the position that they're in. In two games, they're in control. Um, a bright spot, obviously, we talked about Connor McDavid a little bit. He looked even better in this game. He did. He demanded the puck more. He was skating to his full speed, making a lot of uh, confident plays with the puck, which we haven't seen too, too much this year. So. That was a bright spot, but again, something that cost them was the specialty teams. Over, I think three it was on the power play where Florida went two for four. Mm-hmm. Edmonton had two very glorious power plays in the third period where they couldn't capitalize. So like, they've been playing pretty well five on five. It's it's crazy to think that the specialty teams isn't getting it done for them. Is is this a game or was it the Tampa game where we got that viral Bouchard clip where everyone's talking about Bouchard on it? But I want to talk about everybody this one, in the that Florida. One. It was the Florida one. Is it the tie the game or go ahead? I think. Go ahead. I think it was the Kevin Stenling goal. Yeah, he's been putting. Up, he had a good night. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> Former Jets legend. Yeah, Kevin. He had Stenling. three points. <laughs> yeah. What the hell? God damn. Palmer has finally found his guy. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. <laughs> um, but on that play. Actually, there was two plays this week. One of them, I think, was super unfairly given to Bouchard, where it, this was the case. So this was the Tampa game, and then I'll talk about the Florida clip. Okay. Because there's two where it's going very viral on Evan Bouchard. There's a big spotlight on him right now. The Tampa game, it was the tying goal. And in that shift, I believe it was with the dry line. I could be wrong. But the puck gets sent up to uh, Bouchard off a bounce pass off the wall, and there was an awkward kind of angle for it. Bouchard picks it up, and two Tampa Bay Lightning attack him right away, and I believe Nikita Kucherov was one of them. Yeah. And if you look at that play, Bouchard scrambles and dumps it back to try and save face. Now, he dumps it kind of sideways, and it's picked up, and it's a three-on-two the other way. But I'll say this. On that play, if you go watch it, all three forwards were below the hash marks, so there's no defensive support at all. In a, in a questionable time with the puck, right? You know as a hockey player, as soon as there's even question whether a D-man's going to handle it or even one of your teammates, one guy's got to get back. 100%. And then on that play, the, the forward on Tampa that ends up getting it and breaking up the ice, Bouchard does a great job backtracking through the middle yes. of the ice. That guy's no longer a threat. Darnell Nurse gets kind of stuck between which guy, which, I mean, it's a three-on-two. It makes sense. The, the, I think in that situation, the th- slot guy is... Probably the more dangerous guy because you, you got to make that pass through two guys, right? They do make that pass. But I hated that goal on Stuart Skinner because that pass over was so slow. 
it, I, before the one timer. I know exactly what player you're talking about, and for people who are listening, it is the I believe it's the Tanner Geno goal. Yes, yes, it was the Geno goal. So yes, I think you described that perfectly. Like it's a it, he got in an awkward spot. Obviously tried to make a play, just getting it down low. Yeah, obviously not the case. But I agree, he did bust his ass back, which you would obviously love to see. That guy had no lane to the net. The way he was coming down the middle. No, exactly, and exactly the pass was extremely slow, and I believe. He was so far out, too. Like, it wasn't even that insanely of a high danger chat. So, I totally agree. That is a play that Bouchard is getting way over hated for. Yeah, that one shouldn't be at all. And it's clear the spotlight's on him right now in, in Edmonton. But I get why on the Florida one. The Florida one yep. was ugly. He makes uh, the slow pinch up, makes a hit. But the play comes into the D zone. And he's, I think, the fourth guy back, the way it worked out. They actually had forward support that time. <laughs> The biggest problem I have, and I do want to talk about him today because of what I saw in the Florida trip. Leon Dreisaitl drives by a shooting thread in the slot. Mm-hmm. All the, all, all, I can't remember who it was, but all he did was turn his body. And Dry went the other way, which creates an odd man situation in that slot. Now, <laughs> Bouchard gets back into the post, does a loop instead of a stop and start, yeah. which allows a, a goal like, Where's the goal horns because of the slow pinch and that for sure. But Leon Dreisaitl is your third highest paid player, your second best player. And in a time when Connor McDavid is fighting through whatever he's fighting through, we've it's well documented at this point. Yep. And playing some of his best hockey this week, trying to turn things around for the team. I saw the complete opposite from Leon Dreisaitl this week in Florida. And I'm pretty concerned about it as much as, as much as, the goaltending is the biggest issue. We've known for a few years now that the Edmonton Oilers are scary and dangerous when the top two guys are going. Like, you can't contain them. We, we yeah. talked to Keegan Colsar this year. He talked about how, like, you do what you can against those guys. Yeah. Like, it's a real threat. In two, we're at a point where almost every game is a must win game for the Edmonton Oilers. And in two must win games on this Florida trip, coming off a couple good games in Long Island and Seattle. Leon Dreisettle generates 0.2 of an expected goal in back-to-back <laughs> games. Like, we were talking about before going on camera about the fact he's not scoring and they need him to right now. He's not even generating chances. And no. I know the one quote that always stuck out for me growing up, um, I wasn't a big goal scorer. Get to the net, you know, I'll bang away some garbage. Um, would, would create a little bit, but I just never had the shot. I was never a sniper. But my dad and a couple coaches always said, don't worry about when the puck's not going in the net when you're when you're getting chances, because that means you're still doing all the right things. Absolutely, it's when you're not and not scoring that it's a problem. And right now, I'm seeing that with Leon Dreisaitl. Yeah, no, for sure. I it's uh, the complete opposite, obviously, of what we need from him with their offensive uh, woes. You need you really need him to take that step up. We've We've seen in the past where McDavid's been out for injury or you know, obviously not not on his A game and dry you see the really see the dry side will step up. Obviously hasn't been the case. It's it's just frustrating. Like obviously I, I assume he's frustrated, obviously. For sure. Not the the most confident player in the in the world right now, but uh it doesn't take a lot to make effort in the D zone. And that is someone who obviously sets a high example on the Edmonton Oilers. And he is setting examples for all the wrong reasons right now. And it continues to see it throughout the lineup. It doesn't matter if you play, obviously, you know, pro junior, wherever you are, your best players need to be the ones setting the examples. Yes. If you see him fly by on a play, what makes, you know, like Evander Kane, Nuge throughout the entire lineup think, okay, it's, if it's okay for him to do it, I can do it, you know? So it's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, Obviously, he's frustrated as well. It's so it's clear. It, it is. He just, looks like me in every interview. He's got the yeah, hoodie on. <laughs> it has been, man. You see him kind of snap back in a few of his interviews already. It's yeah. just a whole shit show situation right now. It's one of those things too. Like, I like when he snapped about protecting his goalies, but it's another when he's just like pissy about every question when he's not putting in the effort himself. Yep. Um. And I'm just, I'm just having a lot of trouble because obviously I know he's a top five player in the NHL and you don't want to get like too crazy on the lulls, but this team's in an absolute desperate state right now and they can't afford to have these kind of performances from Leon Dreisaitl. No, absolutely. Do you get concerned at all hearing his name brought up on the Big Insiders podcast today? 
Um, I do a little bit. I found I, that really interesting. Today. I'd, you know, you could have mentioned this obviously at any time before. I would have laughed at you and just wouldn't even gave this the time of day. A hundred percent. But the way this season's going, and all, I think pretty much the way it's gone his entire career in Edmonton, it hasn't been the best. Obviously, they have had two nice runs the previous two years, but yep. you look at where they are right now, it's a huge step back. Um, I'd, I am pretty concerned, to be honest with you, with sh- how short of a period of time we have left on his contract. Yeah, it's it's always, as someone that aggregates and listens to everything and over the last few years, you start to, you get an idea when you listen to those guys often, um, when they're just throwing stuff out there that they're kind of suggesting and when they're starting to be like, oh, this is something we might want to monitor moving forward. And I don't think it was by accident that that became the conversation on 32 Thoughts today that Oilers might have to think big picture. There's a big contract coming up. He's one and a half years away. Does he become the big change? And it's crazy to think about right now. But we're at a <laughs> we're we're five eleven and one. Yeah, it's it really is insane to think about. But it's nuts. It's it's gonna have to start being a topic of discussion before it's obviously too late. If that makes sense, or you obviously don't want him to walk for anything type of situation. So let's let's paint the picture here. I did I ran the numbers yesterday. After yesterday's loss. The Oilers would have to go on a basically a sixty five percent points for uh, pace the rest of the year. Can't afford another bad week. Essentially, yeah, that's the pace they need to play at to get the ninety four points, which got the uh, second Walker last year. Now I think it's going to be interesting. I'm really curious what the second wild card in the West ends up being because I do think this is a very very weak year in the West. Yeah. But to put that number into perspective, because I saw a guy like Frank Cervelli saying he still feels there's a 65% chance the Edmonton Oilers make the playoffs. And they're very well might. But I, I think back to Bruce Boudreaux's first year in Vancouver, where they had a start similar to this. They were dreadful under Travis Green, I think it was before. Yeah. Bruce? Yep. And Bruce came in and took that team on a 107-point pace the rest of the year, and they still missed. Yeah. Like, you don't make the playoffs in October, November, but you sure as hell can get kicked out of them. You can easily mess it. You can easily, the way that, it's, it's, a lot of it has to do with the, the point set up in the NHL, the three point games, and it's hard to jump teams. That 65% pace, looking at last year's Edmonton Oilers team, they were a 66% team all year. So they basically, right now, within the next two games, have to find that game and play it the rest of the year. Yep. And, I'm concerned because, for one, the goaltending, I just can't buy right now. I I can't just think of this magical. It would have been sick if Calvin Picard came in and stole a game. and gives you that, like, Hamler <laughs> yeah. type of vibe, especially, you know, Manitoba boy. That didn't happen. No. And you can't expect that to happen, let's be honest. Um, the way the D zone and the breakdowns and how big they are, that doesn't help the goaltending situation, makes it even more difficult. The fact that, you're not getting a 150 point pace out of Connor McDavid, which again, what we saw him do last year, we haven't seen someone do in decades. Yeah. Um, the fact we're starting to see this frustration, frustrated, and not really involved Leon Dreisel, it's hard for me to envision this team flicking the switch right now and going on that pace. And as tough as that is to talk about, at the end of November for a team. Most insiders, most guys covering the sport took to win the cup this year. Every so often, there's just a, a disastrous year in an organization, whether it be even a division rival to look out, Vegas missing the playoffs after going on those yep. deep runs very recently. We see this happen very occasionally, and I'm almost wondering, we're not there yet, but in the next two weeks, if, if we don't start bumping that up, if we start looking at, we start looking at a Leon Dreisettle trade to change the mix moving forward, change the cap situation moving forward. If we don't see them shut down a Connor McDavid or a Matias Eklund for a few weeks until they're healed, and we see a concerted, intentional effort to get as high a pick as possible, because the, the one problem that Edmonton Oilers really have right now in the McDavid window, in my opinion, is they don't have a lot of youth pushing into the lineup, no. so there's no real cheap ELCs. We know how important those are. Like, right now, it's kind of the same as the NFL where 
Rookie NFL quarterbacks are massive as far as building teams out. It's the same way in the NHL. You need impact ELCs, and, and the Oilers just don't really have it. Broberg's had his ups and downs. There's been some signs where it looks good. There's been some times it hasn't. Dylan Holloway hasn't really transitioned as high offensively as we probably have hoped. Yeah, I think he's still a quality third-line player type of thing, but they need some more offense. And I almost wonder if you start looking at this year and say, holy shit, we, we, we're having the nightmare year. Management's changing. We just changed the coaching staff. You know what? It's time to look at how do we not let this happen again next year? Uh, yeah. No, it's... It's hard to talk about, but it really, we, yeah, have it to, is. we have to think about it. I, uh, I never thought I'd be sitting down here talking about trading Leon Dreisaitl ever. It, uh, it is crazy how, how, what this has came to, but it, uh, it definitely is a valid, valid discussion right now. It, uh, I have a hard time seeing them play at this pace, like we said, with the inconsistency in net and the huge defensive flaws to to make that big jump. Um, just like looking at the teams in the West, though, like you you can still do see like you can see a path there. Obviously, you can't. Yeah, the West is just because it is it is that bad in those wild card spots. So these uh, upcoming week or two is going to be obviously huge for this team. Can they can they snap their fingers and make a make that big jump? I I don't think so, but I mean here's uh here's hoping. It's it's fascinating because like there's you're, you're just throwing up a prayer pretty much at this point. You you are and like we've heard the talks with Montreal, but do you look at the Montreal goalies and think that's gonna solve it? You're just kind of hoping to to do what you're doing right now. Pretty for the most part, yeah. Like, I, I think Jake Allen would be the best goalie in Edmonton right now. Pretty easy, hundred percent. But like, is he gonna take them to a cup? That's what I was just gonna ask you, and I don't think he could. I'm not confident he's taking them to a cup. And like, the, the, looking at their cap friendly, man, this is like, I I pride myself on like having ideas and understanding the NHL market and loving trades and stuff. I'm just at a loss for words what the Edmonton Oilers could possibly do to fix this overnight. Uh, I like it, like we've said, it's got to be money in, money out, and that's where it starts to get obviously complicating. I'm looking for fits on teams. Um, you got to try and pay someone to move Campbell and try and kind of go from there, but. If you're paying to move him, really, what assets do you have to buy players as well? So they're in a pretty tough spot. Yeah, let's talk about the Campbell thing because that's obviously been the talk. Uh, Frank Cervelli said today, I think it was today, yeah? I think it was today, yeah. That he thinks it would cost a first and a third to get out of Jack Campbell's money. If that's all it costs, the Edmonton Oilers have to do that tomorrow, in my opinion. Um, just that's a because, no-brainer. What's that? It's a no-brainer. I think the the full thing was Campbell a first and a third, and I think their trade partner was San Jose, and you got Mackenzie Blackwood back. Yeah, I, and see, at that point, I think you still have to do it. Like, I don't think Mackenzie Blackwood's going to be the answer at all, but just to get out of $5 million in cap the next couple of, next four years is worth that price because they're going to need that money to turn this thing over because we talked about it at the beginning of the year. The one tough thing about the Edmonton Oilers' position was they were capped out this year and next year. Like, this was the team. So, I get not wanting to make a panic or a bad trade, but I don't think paying to get out of Jack Campbell should constitute that because you're looking out for the organization's next four years making that kind oh, of Oh, for sure. And if it's only a first and a third, I that feels pretty light to me. Like I feel Especially like if it's next year's first, not this year's. And I think if that's the only thing maybe holding it off is with this year's first, just because year. the way they're looking this year. But yeah, Blackwood only makes 2.3, two years, so it'd be one more year after this one. And I don't think he's the answer, but I've been seeing a lot of people think he might be Canada's next goalie if they went to a best-on-best. Best. We're back to that. Well, I thought that again. was pretty insane, but uh, yeah, I would, I would obviously make that trade in a heartbeat. <laughs> I, I think you have to if it's available. I, I, it's I just see, getting out of that money. Like you, you, ha you have to pay to get it. I, I think for Frank is 
underselling it a little bit. Like a first and a third is about what Cal Peterson cost, but Cal Peterson was also a, a year less. Mm-hmm. Like even if a team were to b- take on um, Jack Campbell just to buy the picks and then buy him out, we're looking at a six-year buyout dead penalty for about one point eight to two million dollars. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask you this then. Actually, let's, on this topic, would you? Let's see the three options right now are wait till the summer and buy out Campbell yourself, uh, because that does have to factor in how we view the trades too. Because that's uh, that becomes a three point two million dollar swing in the cap rather than the five. Um, so would you wait to buy him out? Would you be willing to retain money for the next three and a half years? to make the trade cost more palatable or would you do a trade like you did right now where you, you're going to sacrifice the first and a second, let's say just to get out of the money and bring in some kind of warm body. What, what would your rankings of those be? Um, yeah. Number one would be just pay the assets, get rid of the full contract. No, no retention, nothing. And assuming you're bringing in a, a goalie as well. So it's a, it's a, I wouldn't say high risk, obviously, because you're moving the 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 contract, but you're also bringing in a goalie. Second, I guess would. What would you say the buyout was again? Uh, roughly, I don't have the calculator open, but it was roughly the the penalty fluctuated between one point eight and two million bucks over the course of three times two six years at because it would have to be in the summer. So it'd be the last three years of it. That's a long dead cap. That is, but the cap is also going up. That's true. I, I think no matter what, second would be just whatever the retention is to to get rid of the contract as well. Third would be the the buyout. Yeah, that'd be a lot of dead money between just him and the, Brown next year. And that's the big thing is dead money for for that long of a time. Fuck no, we didn't even start with Connor Brown either. That's fine. That's for another time at this stage. Oh God. Yeah, uh, as of last game, he officially cost three million on the books next year. And has zero goals, zero assists, so he's. Just, just going out there for a skate. And I did see some good points that Connor Brown wasn't necessarily brought in for the first 10 games. He was brought in for the long haul. But, man, that, fe- that, that long haul looks so bleak right now. That well, that's like, the thing. I mean, like, it's... Like, uh, you have to judge the management for that plan when that plan falls as flat as this has. The, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, that's a good point. We're not banking on 10 games, but I just see Jesse Puyarvi all over again, really. That's a that's a good call. So actually. it's uh yeah it's just hard and he, to and yes he didn't carry a dead cap. No exactly. So it's just hard to see him just start turning around producing all of a sudden. Like even fuck I don't know man this team has me at an absolute loss. I'm staring at the cap friendly right now. Even it's ugly. It, 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 it is. is because so let's say let's say I'm coming around on this idea that. It might be a lost season. Yeah. And my idea would be to get out as, as much future money as you possibly can because this is not working. Connor McDavid, obviously, you're not touching him. Just it's, it's a non conversation. You won't ever hear me recommend that. Zach Hyman locked in, like we've talked about, has probably been their most consistent best forward this year. You're not looking to move him. Evander Kane, full new move clause. Can you really move him? I mean, his personality is a new move clause for a lot of teams at this point. Like, the Oilers were his last ditch attempt. Playing good hockey, though, too, right? So, uh, Ryan Eugene Hopkins, full new move clause. And he's got, like, six years at 5.1. And I saw some people, I saw it was on Spin Chicklets. I know our top line group chat was talking about the idea of turning him into a goalie. And I agree with Jordan on this. Like, if you turn Ryan Nugent Hopkins into a goalie, there goes any depth scoring you have. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Because it's not like the bottom <laughs> six is scoring. No. So that that wrote, I don't think he'd waive it anyways. I think he's going to be a career oiler. Yeah, I think so too. So that doesn't work. Warren Fogle, I think you could trade for a, a mid-round pick at the draft or at the, at the deadline. At the deadline. But he's already off the books next year. He's yeah. a UFA. Ryan McLeod at 2.1, is there a taker for him? Or do you even want to move him? Do you like him in the three, third line spot? I mean, uh, I, don't I, know how, I don't know. I don't know if there's a big market for him at 2. And that a, was two what and I was just going to say. I've been pretty clear that I'm obviously a McLeod fan, just the way he plays the game in his defensive uh, game. But I'm he also hasn't. not that much money. No, but he also he hasn't really been producing at all either. So he, I can't see him really being worth anything as well. Trading Derek Ryan for like a late round pick only clears 900K next year. Yeah, so 
And he's been actually been good this year. So <laughs> yeah, I, I would want to keep him anyway, if, like if, if it's just a late round pick. And then if we look at the defense money, Darnell Nurse, full no move, you're not getting out of here. You're him. not getting out of that. Um here's an interesting one I keep coming back to. Matthias Echo. <laughs> Which it's crazy, but like looking at this cap sheet, like where else do you move money right now? And then the problem is you'd have to replace him next year. That's like I mean, the, that's the thing that's like, so tough. Like you're moving Matthias Ekholm, but then you're gonna have to look Matthias for Ekholm a Matthias Ekholm. So, 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 so you're not getting ahead next year by moving him. You're getting out of six times two, but I mean, like we just talked about, you you, you want him there next year. Yeah. Uh, Evan Bouchard at three point nine. I, I mean, I wouldn't recommend moving him. Let's hear your thoughts on Bouchard because he's a polarizing guy, but I'm not moving him at $3.9 million. No, not a chance. Like, the the, the hate in Edmonton with Evan Bouchard is is getting out of hand. We've seen it, obviously, with Jeff Petrie, Justin Schultz, you know, just to name a couple there. He is an elite. I forgot about Justin Schultz starting yes, in Edmonton. Yeah, he's an elite offensive defenseman, and those are fairly hard to come by. Yes, <laughs> He, uh, Impossible to come by. He, he has some <laughs> defensive issues, makes some head scratching mistakes. That's that's hockey. It it happens. Besides, obviously, the elite franchise tier, whatever you want to call defensemen that are insanely good on both sides of the puck, you're not getting pro uh an elite offensive D man who is obviously good on the defensive side, else they'd be in that elite franchise tier. I think you got to find a way to get Bouchard even re-signed after the bridge deal and 100%. and then some because he, he's an incredible hockey player. Yeah, I agree. Running Evan Bouchard out of town, especially being one of the only impact young guys on the team, yeah. would be really silly. And I think you make a good point when you're looking at some of the top NHL defensemen, elite offensive defensemen. Dougie Hamilton's never been known to be a, a defensive stalwart. Mm-hmm. But he's well worth $9 million a year because of what he does at the other end of the ice. Yep. Offense drives contracts because offense drives wins. Um, Josh Morrissey, as much as like we, he gets talked up as a, as a two-way defenseman, uh, the last couple of years he cheats D hard mm -hmm. to go to produce offensively. But as a fan of Winnipeg Jacks, I'd rather that because now he's a point-of-game defenseman rather than a 30-point defenseman occasionally shutting down the opposition. Um, Quinn Hughes until last year. Same way. Uh, I think he's come a long way in that end of town, though. Yep. Um, Eric Carlson. I mean, Evan Bouchard is not Eric Carlson, but the best example of an elite offensive defenseman. Look, look no further than the goal on ice goal differential with this San Jose team that we're watching is probably the worst team we've ever seen without Eric Carlson. Like, yeah, you. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> Makar, I think, gets bailed out a lot by Devin Taves offensively, and he's just so electric offensively that it doesn't matter. Exactly. And we talked about this in Winnipeg with, like, some of the Jet Stars are just terrible defensively. It's easy for fans to look at defense and get really, really obsessed with that being the spot because a lot of people look at defense as the ultimate effort area on the ice. Um, Goals against are remembered a lot more than goals for human nature, negativity. That's just, that's who we are as humans. And some of the clips are absolutely terrible for Evan Bouchard. But this is also a 24-year-old right-handed defenseman, which are never available on the open, or are on the trade market no. in their primes, who's at a point a game through 17 games. Yeah, like for a good most part of the season, he's been pretty incredible. Like I thought his last two weeks have been great, other than, like, those two highlight reels and the, the one I talked about. I wouldn't even put on him. Yeah, no, exactly. And, but like, besides, you know, the, the one or two errors, his defensive game really hasn't been that bad, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's just when it, when it happens. And when it's, but it's it just, just, exactly, when it's bad, it's It's, it's, bad. it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's atrocious. It's, 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 it, I get why people are pissed off, but I think you're losing track of the bigger picture to say, run this kid out of town. If any fan base should know, it's the Jeff Peachy situation. Yep. Absolutely blossomed in Montreal. He was the type of defense they were looking for until they got Evan Bouchard, exactly. man. Exactly. Um, especially when you're, you have high-octane offensive stars in the Ford group that are going to need you to get the puck up to them or 
contribute on the power play, which is an area that if you want to pause Divi, I think still going to come around for the Oilers. Yep. That power play just has too many special players to, to be good but not elite kind of thing. 100%. So then, it, then I come to two other names here that I do think the Oilers sh- should be shopping if we keep going this way. I think you go find a buyer for Cody CC at the deadline yeah. at 3.25. Clear that money for next year. Go get your third or second or whatever. We know trade deadline is the best time to trade defensemen. Teams look to gear up for the playoffs. I do think Cody CC has some value. And I'm not convinced he's an answer for next year. Because I think Cody CC is the spot in the top four you need an upgrade. Yeah. So if you can get out of that money early, grab some assets so you could carry. Because I'm not looking at this like a rebuild. I'm looking to just shed money, create assets, and then go use those assets in a the summer. A one-year off retool type of Correct. thing. Correct. Like, yeah. we're not looking long-term here. It's just trying to better set yourself up for the summer ahead. Because oh, for sure. Yeah, you, you don't go into a rebuild with this team. I think that's just a, a st- a stupid notion. No, that would be over. You're just setting yourself up for failure. Correct. And then the other one I'd be curious about because I think it might be harder. And he's a quality third pairing guy, Brett Kulak. Yeah. That clears out 2.75 for the next couple of years. Um, and by doing that, if it is a, a one year retool loss season, then you're pl- then you're giving Broberg and DeHarnay the rest of the year run to see if there's at Something least depth there. defenders there. Yeah. And that that six mil cleared by Cody CC and Brett Kulak, you go get a top four guy with. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I think that's where I'm starting to lean. Yeah. Obviously, if they can go on a tear and make the playoffs, that's the route you well, go. Then, yeah, that's the number one yeah, option. Yeah, you, you, you have to with this team. You, you have to. But if it gets to that point, those are the two I'm looking to move out of town and just reset the decor, get out of some money, get some more draft picks, and then take another shot at this next summer. Yeah, as far as the entire roster, those are pretty much the only two that I would want to move because you like you said you're you can get some positive assets and it's a spot that you want to upgrade anyway meanwhile like anyone in the forward group are like you said matisse at home you move those guys you're just looking to replace those guys essentially anyway so if it obviously continues in this direction i obviously hope it doesn't yeah but and then i think yeah finding a buyer for the jack campbell situation just a must do just for the sake of the next three years yep just, sure. You just have to do that. Um, the big one for me is you have to have, if you're management, you have to have a conversation with Leon Dreisel before the deadline. If, you go, like, if it becomes a one-year ritual and you got to find out as early as possible if he's going to stay. Oh, absolutely. you got to find out as early as possible. Because if, if, he, if he tells management, which I'm just speculating based on the fact we're starting to hear his name yeah. brought up and thinking big picture. If he says he's not signing, this trade deadline's the time. If you're out of it. Like, if we're going down this path. Yeah, yeah. Because you're going you're gonna to find value for Leon Dreisel. I have no doubt about that on the trade market. Oh, 100%. In the summer, even. Yeah. But we've seen the NHL has really shifted how much they're spending on one-year assets versus one and a half years, two, yeah. three. And Leon Dreisel is in a special tier where you're still going to get significant assets oh for sure in the summer because he's likely he controls his destiny he's likely gonna request if if he requests i it's i still have, <laughs> i still have trouble believing it i still have trouble believing yeah. it but if we get to that situation he's gonna control and you're, you're gonna expect him to resign with the team you're gonna trade to yeah you'd imagine but all of a sudden if you have a few contenders he's willing to go to at the deadline he becomes the number one asset at the deadline where you're talking top prospects roster players that could kind of reshape what the Edmonton Oilers look like, bring in some of those ELCs we're talking about, get them in the lineup next year. And all of a sudden you have a, a real big chunk of money to fix the D with the guys we said move off the D. And instead of running a top four, let's say, all of a sudden you might be doing what the Winnipeg Jets just went through. Yep. Instead of being a two-line team, you become a, a three or four-line team with the nuclear option at the front of it and Connor McDavid. Yep. I just think that's going to be a fascinating story to pay attention to. Yeah, it's obviously something you, you'd you want to pay attention to as an Oilers fan. That's the been the second best player on your on your team, sometimes Maybe even, even in, the in the league, yeah. for, for numerous years. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I have a hard time believing it or I just don't want to believe it, that he, he's going to leave just obviously – what he's done in Edmonton's been obviously incredible. 100%. His relationship with Connor McDavid. Um, 
You only do this if he tells you he's not. Yes. Safe. Oh, one million percent. This is not me advocating to go shop and trade. No, no, no. Leon no. Dry said I'll. <clears throat> but that conversation has to be had going into the deadline. If if they're in if the they're still if trending they're still this way, spot. yeah, no, for sure. Um. So I'll ask you, you here, and then we'll we'll go in the week ahead, and we'll get out of here because this was a a lot going on. A lot of these conversations are going to still be had later on in the year. It's really hard to say right now. How where are you at with the Edmonton Oilers making the playoffs? Like how like if you were to say today, where do you think are you? I don't know. You get what I'm saying. I need. I need w- one more week to, for a confident answer. If that if that's that, fair, that's more than fair to me. I've, I'm so torn with this team because I've, even this year you've seen flashes of them looking very strong, very dominant, and then they just collapse. Um, I don't know why. I believe they can still just somehow flip a switch and turn it around and become that dominant team we saw in the second half of last season. But s- somewhere in my guts, telling me there's still a little bit there. Especially the way McDavid looked in the the last game, even in the Tampa game, he's yeah. starting to look like back to himself. I just I can see him going on. Obviously, his psychopath run that he's he's done in the past. I I just want one more week to get a, a true telling on what this team really is. Yeah, I think I'm fair. I think that's fair. I'm I'm at I'm on the teetering. I'm teetering right on that line. Yeah, where that's I'm where like I am. I'm looking at the <laughs> math, and the math is awfully tough. But then it's also like you have the two cheat codes where if they find it, that might be all you need. Exactly. So it, it's hard to completely give up on them. But it's also quite telling that they're third last in the West in goal differential at this point. Like <laughs> a lot, there, there's, there's teams where they're like losing one goal games and they have like a minus three or maybe even they're losing games and they have a positive goal differential. And it's like, okay, this should start to turn into wins at some point. Third worst in the West in that 17 games in. It's just yeah. it's blown in my it's mind, brutal. man. Very ugly. So, but but then you want the optimism. You, I think the top three teams in both divisions are locked in at this point. Stars, yeah, Avs, Jets, Golden Knights, Canucks, Kings are probably the only six I have any confidence making the playoffs. Yeah. After that, you're looking at a combination of the Blues, the Coyotes, the Predators, the Wild, who are having just as dreadful of a start in Edmonton. Um, you're looking at the Kraken, who I was higher on coming in, and that's looking like a bad decision. Though they're kind of pulling the Calgary right now, where they're sneaking in that extra point mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of games. The Ducks, who we see the Ducks have a lot of hot starts over the last couple of years. Though it does feel a little different this year, because they do have some real talent coming into the lineup. Yep. I just think we're still a year away from them sneaking into a Walker spot. The Flames have kind of turned it around lately, quietly. A little bit. But it's still a team that the noise is too much. We know they're shopping those guys. I can't see them deviating from that. So there's no team above them that I like better than the Edmonton Oilers. Well, that's it's just why such a, co- a gap that they've built. That's obviously one of the another big reasons why I'm staying so, I guess, optimistic that they can still be in the playoffs because literally all those teams you named are just a – it's a meh. Yeah. But, I mean, what makes me think Edmonton can turn it around because they've been obviously just as bad, if not worse, than these teams named. But if I'm a betting man on someone to obviously to get hot and – Go on a big streak. It, it would have to be them out of all out of those teams. If if all those teams are on an equal playing field right now, I'm taking the Edmonton Oilers easily. I'm, I would imagine everyone would. You would think anyway. It's just so hard to gain nine points and jump six, seven teams over the course of the year. Yeah, and that's that's it's, the situation. It's going to take a lot. Around. Oh yeah, it's going to take a lot. They they can't afford one more bad week. No, they really can't. So, fast, fascinating storylines to unfold in Edmonton. We'll leave it there with some of the ideas we're bouncing around in our head. Let's take a shot at what the, the weekly schedule is here. We got the Carolina Hurricanes tomorrow night at 6. The NHL schedule this week, just garbage. No games tonight, no games Thursday. <laughs> Edmonton, Carolina, how are you feeling about that one? <laughs> uh, not good. I... Carolina always just seems to have Edmonton's number. I think if that's a team this year, they might get though the way that Carolina's playing. They're yeah, they haven't, they haven't really past. looked the same. 
as well. But another team not getting goaltending either. No, a lot of injuries with all their goalies as well. And mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, someone about Carolina playing in Carolina seems to always have Edmonton's number. I'm I'm taking Carolina on this one. I'm gonna take the Oilers in a track meet. Okay. Which I mean. They play. Seems so. like that's how they're yeah. gonna have to win anyway. So yeah, I, I I'm taking the I, I'm taking the Oilers in that one. I can't believe what I'm about to do, but I'm taking the Oilers that one. <laughs> then we got a Friday afternoon game in Washington. Yep. Who's kind of come around of late? Yeah, they've surprised me for their start. To be honest it's, with you. Yeah, I didn't think they had any juice left in the left in the tank there. How do you think that one plays out? This is where I think Edmonton gets back in the in the win column there. I don't know. Some about Washington just doesn't give me anything to, like exciting about besides Ovi. Like I don't know. I just some about Washington. I'm not really a fan of. Good for them on their hot start though. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm right there with you. They've they've won a few in a row here, but it's not yeah. a team I'm overly overwhelmingly believing in. No, I think like I. And they feel like they're a team ripe for a loss too. I just don't think their success is sustainable throughout the entire year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take. Uh, I'm gonna tell you in advance. I'm gonna take the Oilers three zero this week. Three zero. I got them two one. I think they'll beat the Ducks. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, I'm gonna set up the Ducks and I'm gonna let Mikey in real quick. Sounds good. Um, uh, Oilers versus Ducks. On, no, it sounds like you got in. Oilers versus Ducks Sunday. Yeah, I got the Ducks. Uh, I mean, not. The, uh, I got the Oilers. I'm taking the Oilers too. Um, so. If I'm right, we're having a totally different conversation next week. Oh, yeah. If you're right, it's still better going through. Better. Through I like your prediction a lot more than mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if they go and get six points, we, next, week, um, next week could be a totally different It gets really time. interesting. Yeah. And you know what? I, this is why I'm stupid. Because <laughs> even after everything I've watched with the Oilers, I'm still betting on them still to have a 3-0 week. And it, it's, it's ridiculous of me. <laughs> but Yeah, I'd say it's pretty crazy from what we've watched so far all year. Ins- it's insane. Um, but I, I just don't love Carolina's goaltending and I love, I like Edmonton's top end talent, especially if McDavid is back. I think that's a game he could win in a, in a track meet. Yep. Capitals have been hot. They're going to be due for loss. I just don't buy them being that team that goes on big wins. I can't buy them either. And the Ducks (coughs) starting to falter a little bit of late. Yeah. That to me is a game they have to have in the division, a team they're chasing, a young team. Oh, yeah. That, to me, is a, a, a big one. Oh, for Bigger sure. Bigger than it should game, be. Division game, it's in their team they're trailing in the standings. That's a, a must win. Must win. So, fascinating week ahead. Fascinating season ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, kind of scared for you. Kind of excited for you to see where this all plays out. And I'm looking forward to getting back together next week. To see where we're at and how bad that 3-0 and week uh, looks on my part. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. Kind of scared, kind of excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. And make sure, you know, check it. Uh, make sure to keep checking us out. And uh, stick with those Oilers for now. <laughs> for now. <laughs> for now. The, the bridge is coming. This has been a Top Line Media production.